The Power Factor Show. Episode 97. You can find this podcast and others at Gun Rights Radio Network, gunrightsradio.com, podcasting freedom. Brought to you by Safariland and Hodgton, the gunpowder people. Okay, so we're going to talk about shotgun chrono. Um, the first time I ever chronoed with a shotgun, I was really afraid what was going to happen because, <laughs> you know, I chronoed before with a handgun, and, and I asked John, it's like, I'm sure not going to blow my chrono? And he's like, no, it's going to be okay. You're right. Yeah, and then you put pellets through the uprights. I do have actually pellets through my uprights in my chrono. But the chrono itself is it still okay. It was fine, yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, we talked before about reloading, about verifying your loads with a chrono. And there are a couple reasons why you'd want to do that, which we can discuss here. And one of them is that we mentioned before that we, when you're dropping powder, you use these bushings. And the bushings are based on volume, but not based on weight. So you can have different batches of powder. They're going to be more dense than the other batch. And you'd be surprised you will see that. But it's always a good thing to, you know, go out, follow the, follow the load book like we've told you before, um, and then go out and test your loads and actually see what they're doing. Uh, so that's one of the other reasons, just basically verification of, of what the load book says. Just want to confirm that. But the other reason, and this kind of gets into after you after you become like an experienced reloader after a period of time, you may want to start experimenting a little bit with components. Now there are certain components that I will experiment with, and there are certain ones that I won't. Um, powder is one that I will not experiment with. Holes are something I will not experiment with. When it comes to wads, the only experiment that I'll make is that if, let's say, the load data says use a WA-12 SL wad. Okay, that's a Winchester wad, but there are other companies that are out there manufacturing a clone of the Winchester wad. So as we mentioned before, Claybuster makes a CB-1100, which is a clone of the Winchester yep. wad. And that's actually what John, well, you've switched no, no, to... No, I still use a lot of those. Are you? Okay, yeah, so that's what I'm primarily using. That's right? why I have two presses. <laughs> yeah, you're lucky. Uh, and hopefully someday I'll have one yes, of your you presses, but... Um, so I've, I've mentioned before that I've always I've shot CB1100 wads. I'm back to shooting CB1100 wads, but that's the type of component substitution I'll make. Of that, if they, you know, if you're shooting a Remington wad, there is a, a a secondary market clone of a Remington wad, and there are multiple different manufacturers. Claybuster makes those too. Clay, Claybuster makes those. Um, uh, what's it, Duster wads yeah. or whatever they make them? There's a bunch. There's Downrange, a few different. Yeah, you know, everybody. Ballistic specialties, whatever. Yep. Downrange. There's a couple different companies that are out there making, or, or I should say, have the clone market. They make uh, equivalents of the higher end wads at half the price. Um, so those are the type of substitutions that I, I will consider making or actually do make. The other substitution I would make um, is with primers. Now, I'll only do this if the load that I'm creating is not at the top end already of a, what's, you know, the safe region for reloading. So in terms of pressure, you know, 12 gauge is what, 11,500 PSI. Yes. The loads we're loading typically are around 7,000, 8,000 or so, give or take PSI. So I'm, if I'm off, if I'm a little bit hot or whatever, and I go from, let's say, 8,000 to 9,000, I'm still well below um, the, the top range that you would... Uh, consider going with 12 gauge. In terms of primers, generally speaking, Remington's are, are, the, so, are the slowest, or the, the is it Brizance, is that the word? Brizance. Brizance, all right. Oh, yeah. So Remington is at the bottom end and Federal's <laughs> at the top end. Um, I've typically loaded Winchester, which are right in, in the middle, but sometimes I'll make a Federal substitution for a Winchester, so the Federal's going to be hotter. When I do that, I'll actually back down on the powder and then go to the federal primer, see where I'm at, and usually nine times out of ten, um, a, a one drop and a powder bushing going up with a federal is pretty much even. But that's the type of substitution I'll consider making. But I also always want to go off and check this out and make sure that, yes, it is what I expected it to do before I go off and create, you know, a thousand rounds all of a sudden to decide later on, oops, that was a mistake, I'm over pressure. Yep. Um, so that's really been, you know, my experience of... of of my substitutions. What, have, what, are, what are your feelings I'll, I'll about that? I'll play a little bit. Uh, most of the loading guides, I look at uh, loads for, you know, the 12Ls and 12SLs mm -hmm. and the clay buster equivalents if that, you know, guide has it in there. Generally speaking, the SL wad 
for a given load is going to give you maybe up to a thousand psi more. Really? Okay. Than than the gray wad. Right. Right. And uh, and do you know why that is? Because I've noticed that also in the load data, and I I never understood why that I, is. The I case. think it has to do. It probably has something to do with uh, the shorter legs. Oh, on the L wad okay. than the yeah. SL, yeah. Because the shock cups, if if you take them shock cup to shock cup, mm -hmm. they're the same size, exactly. but the SL wad is taller, mm -hmm. and uh, it's just it, the, the difference in height, I believe. It's probably so, the difference. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And you were talking about pressures before. I I was shooting uh, 18, 18 two, I think it was of uh, clay dot. On seven eight ounce loads, okay, and I was getting twelve fifty or so, but I wanted to go faster because of the lighter load. Right, I, I wanted the speed because I, I don't want it breaking up out there. Yeah. I want it to yeah. hold together, so I wanted to go faster, and uh, that's why I changed the wads. Well, that was another issue, but uh, <laughs> of the shot dropping out of the shell. Yeah, that's okay. yeah. But, John, uh, John likes perfect cribs. But I, uh, <laughs> so I was looking at that. But with what I'm loading now, 21.2 grains of international, and we just chronoed it, and that's basically averaging 1246, 1248. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, 1346, 13, 1348. Yeah, right. That's where I want to be. And in the books, that's about a 9,000 pound uh, 9, PSI, PSI load. Yeah. load. Yeah. And to get up that high. Well, you couldn't do it safely mm -mm. with a faster powder like no. clay dot or clays. Right, right. But I wanted to get up there, so I had to change powder. Uh, right. Uh, now, the other thing that you've done in terms of primers is that you are using the Fiocchi primers. Right, which they say are similar to Winchester. Or so. so Similar to a 209, a Winchester 209. 209 right. And uh, the various boards where they've gone to Alliance and asked mm -hmm. them, uh, so, so what's up with that? Or Hodgenon, is this a safe load by substituting the primer and what it'll do? And everything I've seen published on that says basically it's a safe substitution. Right. But again, I'm not pushing 11,000 PSI. Exactly, right. And I don't want to be pushing. Yeah. But I, I want to be somewhere eight to 9,000, so it's basically a clean burn, mm -hmm. and it's still uh, a cushion. And from your so. standpoint, I mean, if the load data said use a Winchester primer and it's going to go, let's say, 1250 feet per second, and you put a Fiocchi in there and it goes 1245, you're in the neighborhood. You're good. good. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. It, from your standpoint, the load data that they publish and what you're shooting is effectively yeah. the same thing. That gives you confidence that you're not and doing anything. And for the guys that uh, reload metallic and they're reading the primers and looking for yeah. smear and stuff, you will never see one pressure sign on a shot, on a shell. shot shell. Yeah. It's just not going to happen. So right. you, You've got to believe in what the low guides do. Yeah, yeah. That, like John's pointing out, there, there's no there's no indicators that you can look for saying, "Oh, I'm getting close to pressure peaks or pressure max or whatever." Unfortunately, the sign is when your barrel blows. <laughs> yeah, which is not good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, like Steve was saying too of, uh, about you know checking loads after a change of components. I, I changed uh, lots of clay dot mm -hmm. and loaded up a whole bunch of them. And noticed the last time I shot that the barrel was really dirty inside, unburned powder and stuff, and it hadn't been that way before. So now, you know, 450 rounds after the fact, I weighed the powder charge that my press was dropping, mm -hmm. and there's just a difference in the lots, uh, and it it needed to go a larger bushing, and it was dropping right at one full grain less. Wow. And we, yeah. we chronoed those here today, and that was like 150 feet less. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. so, and like we've said before, I mean, even though the, the bushing charts give an indication of what it should be, always check, you get, double check, you and weigh. verify. You really got to weigh yep. it and confirm for yourself. And like your point being is that it's not just like you go out and buy clays and all clays are on the same or whatever the case is. And I'm just using that as representative powder. So lots of lot lots of lots of lot. You get a big jug, verify it, and make sure that it really is where you're expecting it to be. So. And it's really not that hard to no, weigh some no, charges. It's easy. You know, everything's averages anyway. Right, right. Now, the other thing, and we'll show you here about what chronoing is all about. It's really not scary. You won't blow your chrono away if you shoot it with a shotgun. Well, you will blow it away if you shoot it with a shotgun, yeah. but shooting over it, you won't. But one other thing that you want to take into consideration is the choke that you're using in your gun when you do this. Um, if you, you'll find that a full choke will actually result in a higher foot per second velocity for the same given load compared to a cylinder uh, choke. 
the theory is, is that the pellets are all ramming down the barrel, they hit the choke, they start constricting, and then the other pellets behind it hit it and basically just launch the thing and ricochet it out. And it happens more with, it, with more constriction as opposed to less constriction, like a cylinder or whatever, where they're basically just all flying out. So that's one of the theories. I don't know if it's true or not, but it sounds plausible. Um, but at any rate, just to keep in mind that if you go off and you chrono your loads, that the choke that you have in your gun when you do it may result in about a uh, 20 foot per second difference yeah. of what you're thinking you're going to get uh, versus what you actually get. And I, I chrono generally the choke that I'm going to shoot the load with. Right. Right. So I know how it's going to perform. And in my case, I run the same load for everything, just changing the shot size for speed versus uh, everything else. You're so, lazy. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have two presses. <laughs> okay, so we'll... Uh, You're going to fire something we'll here? We'll fire some over here, and we'll see what this looks like. Surprisingly, oh. both Steve and I have the same chronograph. And surprisingly, it's the standard for USPSA. Yeah. If you go to a, uh, a Nationals or any major match with USPSA, they're going to use two of these CED chronos in a light box to chrono your loads. So that's why we have what we have. It's funny you should mention that because when I went to buy a chrono shooting competitively in USPSA matches, I thought, you know, I don't want to be have any surprises when I go to the chrono yep. station. So I'm going to get the same chrono that they use because if I go out and chrono ammo and it goes, let's say, you know, a thousand feet per second over mine, I can be pretty certain that it's going to go a thousand feet per second over theirs. Yep. Um, so that's really the primary reason. I mean, CED is a great company. They build great chronos. There's a lot of features in this thing. But I've seen too many people get surprised going to matches where it's like, wow, you know, your chrono must be slow. Or they always have an excuse for the chrono yeah. being a problem. Or and the that, elevation or the temperature yeah, or, or, right. or whatever. Yeah, just pick, pick an excuse and yep. you'll find a good one. Um, but I really never wanted to have any surprises when I went to a match, especially after, you know, you spent all the money for a flight, hotel, match fee, everything. Rental car. Rental car. And you think you're shooting major, and you go there because at home your load's probably at, you know, 170 feet per second. I'm sorry, 170 power factor. And then you go to it, and all of a sudden they're using a different chrono than what you use, and it's running 164, and all of a sudden you're not shooting major anymore, you're shooting minor. Um, and, of course, that puts you yeah. in a really good mood uh, for the rest of the match. So don't like surprises. Um, Rick's been surprised numerous times. So He's living on the edge. Yeah, living on the edge. Yeah. Um, better than any race. So no surprises when you run a, run a CD chrono. But basically the way for, if you're not familiar with the way a chrono works, very simple. Um, you have basically two light screens here and electronics behind it. Um, what happens is that the bullet flies over the two sensors. The sensors basically see the shadow of the bullet flying over. There's a clock behind it, and using the old distance rate and time formula, you can very quickly figure out what the rate is since you know the distance between the two sensors, and it's very critical that you maintain this distance. Yep. That's why they give you a bar that they know is, is the right length. You put these on at the right points here. And you know the time. The time is a time base of basically the processor that's running this thing. So it knows the distance, it sees the bullet fly over, it knows the time, and then it can based on that figure out rate. Very simple uh, calculation. But that's basically the way a chrono works. Now one of the problems that you're going to see on chronos is that since they're trying to see the shadow here, um, if you have blue sky above you or sunlight, direct sunlight, it can really screw chronos up because it can't actually actually very well see the shadow. So they give you something called a sky screen, uh, which is basically a white cover that goes over the top of the chrono. Uh, a lot of times in a pinch, guys will use the um, the backside of an IPSC target. So you can see that's a sky, sky screen. screen there. Basically what happens is that you just click it on yeah, here like that, click it on here pop that back in and now you've got a sky screen which gives you a white uh, opaque uh, top here so it's much easier to see it'll, the shadow, you'll of, see the the shadow of the bullet you'll yeah. see the shadow of the bullet better and blue sky and direct light will really screw chronos up um, so like I said if you don't have the sky screens or if you don't, if you have a different type of a chrono or whatever, a lot of times guys will just go off and take it. It's a target, put it upside down with the white back on there. Yep. Um, it, it does work out well. Uh, the other way that's pretty much foolproof is an infrared screens that they'll put on top of these things. And John was mentioning, they call it a coffin box. They'll take two chronos and they usually use them in, in major matches and they put them back to back so you have a way to confirm or back up the first reading. And actually USPSA rules require that there are... Yep. are 
uh, two, well, yep. they have different requirements, but one of the requirements is if you have two chronos back-to-back -back like this, they deem that as a, um, an approved method. Uh, if you don't, you have to go through and get an average and confirm it and this, that, and the other thing, which is just a big mess. So what you'll see is two of them. And what they do is they take these things, they put them into a coffin box with spe specific lighting that doesn't vary um, and eliminates the whole entire problem of blue sky, sun, weird things like that. So, so it's, it's consistent. It's it doesn't matter what time of day they chrono you, right. whether it's you know, in the morning or late afternoon, yep. the light is going to be the same. Right, right. And, and like I was saying before, there's... You know, competitors don't like being fooled, tricked, and they'll come up with, I mean, the chrono runs something, and they're like, oh, no, your chrono can't possibly be right, because at home, my load's 175 power factor, so, you know, 164 here, that just can't possibly be right. And, they, and you know, you don't want to get into that whole entire no. discussion or argument. Because you're not going to win. Right, right. So the thing is, is that you want to really make sure that your chrono is accurate and working, uh, and no surprises. Uh, so that's really the purpose of, of why it made your matches. They go to all these lengths and putting them in coffin boxes and using the infrared uh, light, light sources and everything like that. So in a nutshell, um, that's the way a chrono works, but it's a really great way of, of testing your loads out. Uh, and you definitely do want to do it if you're a competitive shooter. Um, you know, you can go up for the load data books and they say, well, this should be this velocity and you shoot that. Well, out of their barrel, it was that, but out of your barrel, who knows? Um, so you really want to find out what your loads are actually doing over a chrono rather than getting surprised at a major match where the load data book says something and you think it's going to be right. In reality, you're you know, three or four points below what you were expecting your power factor to be. So. Steve, Steve, Steve's the engineer, so he knows more about all these statistical functions. But one of the things I like about this chrono is it'll talk to you. There's, I call it that, the little Asian lady voice inside of it, and she'll give you uh, whatever the numbers are. She'll give you the speed of the shot. Uh, if if you put in for power factor, it's got a function for that where you can load the weight of the bullet, and then she'll tell you what the power factor is on it. Uh, I don't know what half these things do. The the big things I look at are what the highs, lows, extreme spread is, what the standard deviation is, you know, especially for handgun stuff. Uh, when playing USPSA, you want all of them to make the number. You want your slowest shot to be at least a 165. Right. Uh, but I, I have eight shotgun rounds in this. And, you know, one went 1232, 1235. So I, I believe on this string I've got uh, eight shots in here so there's what number four 1210 1198 1187 1172 1212 and these were I believe my skeet load so the average is going 1204 the fast one is 1235 the slow one is 1172 so Basically, in reloading, you're going for averages anyway. You're going for an average uh, powder drop. You're going for an average weight of a bullet or shot drop. So you're going for average speed. So this is about where I want to be, around 1,200 feet on my skeet load. One, two, three, four. So you don't have to look back at it when you're doing shots. It'll, it'll tell you what's going on. One, two, three, four. Oh, let's see, uh, 384. That's my, that's my power factor on my skeet load. <laughs> so anyway, it's got a lot of uh, these functions in it which are really helpful when you're you know, building a load. Uh, you can play with uh, particularly metallic, different head stamps on brass. Right. You'll get lots of uh, different speed readings. Uh, how many times the stuff has been reloaded, and then you'll either get really good standard deviations or not. Yeah, and then one of the other things that you can do with this is you can also take um, and hook it up to a computer and dump the data to um, a computer spreadsheet. You can dump it to a text file, and that's a lot of times what I'll do is I'll yeah. shoot, and then I'll, I'll take the thing home, dump it, and actually store it in my... Um, my iPhone actually along with the rest of my load data for my skeet loads. So it's a nice handy way of being able to yeah. go back and look at it, look at all the, at this, the high, the low, the average, standard deviation, yep. extreme spread, everything. Okay, so this is what uh, Shotgun Chrono is all about. I'm
Normally with the chrono, pistol loads you want to be about, I think they say about 10, 10 feet away or so from the chrono. The idea is that the gas is coming out of the gun and any other particulate and whatnot can basically cause the chrono, chrono to get a false reading. So with a pistol you want to back up. Problem is with a shotgun, if I back up, I will blow my chrono away or there's a very good chance of it. Uh, I should also say one of the other things I really like about the CED is that if you do have an accident and you nail one of your sensors, a sensor is like, I think, 30, 35, bucks. 35 bucks or so, give or take. As opposed to some of the other chronos out there that if you pull it low and you put a round right through it, you blow away literally your whole entire chrono, so you're out now a chrono. Uh, of course, there are cheap chronos out there and 35 bucks for a sensor versus maybe $70 for a whole entire new chrono. You know, you can look at that and go, well, it's half the price. Um, but on the other hand, I really think these are better chronos than those other ones also. They're really consistent. The features that we talked about, um, I think, are a lot more, val more value for the dollar than those other ones. So with a shotgun, usually what we do is back off about three or four feet so we don't get the, the basically the shot to take out your chrono. So this is what it looks like here. Ears. And usually you want to fire at least five rounds to get a good average. This chrono um, needs at least five to give you all the statistics. Right. I think this will be my fifth if I'm counting right. Yep, it will be. There you go. Was that five? That's five. So based on that now, we can clearly go or quickly go through here. Average is 1224. High is 1231. Low is 1208. Standard deviation is nine, which is pretty good. The lower standard deviation, the better. Uh, and then extreme spread is 23, so 23 feet per second between my highest and my lowest. And then you can store it, and then I can go home and dump this out onto uh, my computer. Okay, so as you see, we didn't blow our chrono away today. Yay. <laughs> yet again. Yeah, yet again, we had a successful day at the range of not destroying our chrono. So, so that's basically uh, chronographing in a nutshell. Um, Obviously more towards shotgun than handgun, but I think you know enough now about handgun that uh, you could probably extrapolate that and figure it out. Um, it's, all, it's all basically the same um, in terms of the way chronos work, but I think the importance here is to go out and chrono your loads and find out where they're at. Uh, if you, uh, and speaking from the standpoint of a handgun, um, yeah, fiddling around with primers, you're going to see variations. Uh, yep. Fiddling around with different types of bullets, you're going to see variations. Cases. Fiddling, yeah, I was just going to say cases, you're going to see variations. variations. Yeah, big variations in cases. Um, but like John was saying is that if you go to a major match, you want to make sure that your lowest, I mean, if you, let's say you shoot 10 rounds and your average is high, you don't want, you want to make sure that it's, you know, that your average is there, not because you had, let's say, you know, five really good ones and five really slow ones, because at a chrono, when you do it in a match, they pull eight, fire three. Well, if they fired those three and they're all low, you're, you are really in, in trouble right now from the get-go. So you want to make sure that your your slowest is at least higher than, than, than the power factor. What that the floor you need, is, yeah. Where the floor is for the power factor. So all the rest of them are above that and it will give you a little bit of a cushion. So uh, if you have any questions, as usual, uh, hit powerfactorshow at gmail.com, website powerfactorshow.com, and the last one, facebook.com slash powerfactorshow. So uh, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Thank you.